Jai Gudev, welcome everybody. Um, today I was thinking what to share with you. <laughs> it was a funny situation. You see, every day when we are eating, the monkeys are coming. You know, the monkey in Vrindavan is very famous for stealing everything. You know, when you go to the marketplace, they steal your glasses. And uh, right now, there's not many, many people. Basically, when they, they steal your glasses, so automatically you have to throw a juice to them or something, but they can just drop your glasses back to you. So lately, there's no, all the marketplaces close and uh, people are not really around also. You know, when people are walking, they always throw things around. So the monkeys are hanging around here because they know that we are cooking food for 50 people here. So <laughs> this just now we were, I was painting, I was putting eyes on the deity and uh, <laughs> we had some noise in the kitchen. <laughs> One of the devotees went by, <laughs> he didn't see anything. I keep hearing noises. I went in the kitchen. There were two, one little monkey who was making noise outside just to divert the people. And there was one big one taking everything what he can and throwing outside. Uh, so it was really funny. And also, <laughs> we have to chase them away. I tell you, it's so funny. These monkeys are so intelligent. Uh, they sit here and they make noise. Lately, they have not been coming here. So this is amazing when there is satsang. Whereas otherwise, you can hear them. No? While satsang, you hear them walking around. Or you see what I'm looking at them. So that has been happening. And uh, ah, yeah, yesterday was wonderful because uh, yesterday night, we had pizza and uh, all the devotees have two two pizza we had made more than 100 pizza and we made it on wood we made it not on wood i mean on charcoal and uh, amazingly it was very nice i was impressed myself so <laughs> yeah. you see how wonderful quarantine we are having here in Vrindavan. I'm sure you also are having a, such a great and wonderful quarantine at home. And really, I'm sure also you're enjoying yourself. And also one thing is that we are having quiz every night on a different subject, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam and so on. It's really very educative. You should do that also. And uh, sometimes we were watching some uh, nice saint movies. Yeah. So we are quite busy here in Vrindavan. <laughs> I'm sure everybody will agree. <laughs> so I will ask Swami Rivati now to ask a question. Jagudev Guruji? Yeah, yeah Jagudev. <laughs> Seeing the stories of Vishnu's main incarnations, so many people were cursing each other right, left and center. <laughs> In all, it's clearly seen how the curses were not only fulfilled, but even had to be fulfilled. Nowadays, is this also the case if someone curses? Actually, uh, you see the sages, they would not curse randomly like that. As uh, if you are educated into that uh, society, you know, that uh, if you have been studying really the Vedic uh, culture, you will see that a curse, it is a blessing in disguise, especially when it comes from a sage, a saintly person. Of course, you will not perceive it when you're hearing it, when you're reading it. Because you see, the word curse in itself is a very terrible thing. But a blessing can come in many ways. Yeah. 
And mostly blessing come in ways which we don't expect it to come. So whether curses still happen? Yes. Because you see nowadays people do more offenses than doing something to receive the blessing. So due to that, they bring more curses upon themselves. So mostly, who is cursing who nowadays is you yourself, you're cursing yourself by how you think and by your action. And of course, when you hurt somebody's heart, automatically you will get cursed. It's not a curse, it's a, you see, when you hurt somebody, that person heart feel that hurt. It is not the heart of the person which is feeling that hurt. Actually, it is the Atma itself. How many times in one life, you know, one have hurt somebody? Knowingly and unknowingly. Many times. And in your point of view, do you think, yes, I'm doing something right? But what is into that person which you are hurting? You don't know what is inside the person. So, yes, curses are still happening. And of course, when you create offenses, for example, towards uh, the master, and towards uh, the devotees, of course, you are getting cursed. But of course, a, a master or a devotee will not go around and tell you, oh, you, I'm cursing you because of this and that. But this happened naturally, because it is a curse from the Atma itself, not recognizing the grace which God has given you to be in the proximity of that person, what you have to learn to be among these people. You see, in life you will not find everybody, you will not get only good people around you. You find all kinds of people. So, the Master showed the way of love. But it's up to you really to learn to accept it and walk that path. So, coming on to that thing, on that question again, you know, the sages were cursing. In reality, their curse was a long-term planning of how things must be. One of the beautiful experience of that curse is uh, Gandhari the mother of the Kauravas. After all her children had been killed in the Mahabharata war, on the Kurukshetra, all of them were dead. At the end of the war, they all came to ask the blessing of the, of the king and also of the queen, because they didn't have any enmity toward them. But you see, the mother's heart was so much uh, full with anger. When Krishna came there on the, uh, in front of the, of the queen, as the mother, she could not resist. said, you are the lord of the universe. You could have changed everything, a click of finger. But why have you not changed? Out of her anger, she cursed Krishna, saying that, your whole generation, your, all your children will be killed the same way as my children have been killed. You know, your dynasty will finish. And Krishna happily said, Mother, I accept it. He, the Supreme Lord himself, accept that curse from Gandhari. Because it is a planning also how he should exit this world. It's a long-term planning. Like I always say, people have 
short-term planning. The divine have a long-term planning. So like that, that curse become a mean for the Lord to finish his incarnation in this world. And of course, you know the story how the children of Krishna start fighting with each another due to a curse which they received. You know, they were uh, uh, buffening a, a sage, you know, they were pretending to be pregnant and they put a, a boulder, they put a, a how say? Uh, eh? Pestle and mortar. Yeah, p pestle and mortar inside of them, and they went to a sage and said, "That sage, please bless us. You know, she is pregnant." And uh, just to cut the story short, the sage realized that they were just making fun of him. So the sage uh, beat so and he cursed this. Through that, that the the child, the 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 samba, what's his name? No, mm -hmm. he became pregnant, <laughs> and then when he. He have to deliver. He deliver a ball. He deliver how say a ball of metal, which they crush and throw it into the river, uh, into the sea. Actually, <laughs> the fish ate it, and the uh, thumb of the how say the metal went into because they grind it completely into powder. So the metal went around. Some uh, grass uh, how say reeds grow with this inside. So like that. This became the object of uh, that curse. So to finish, so they start fighting with each other and they kill each other. So just to show you how also a curse can be also a long-term planning for the divine also to exist. You know, not every curse is really a, a curse like terrible. It is always how you take it. You know, the curse can be a blessing also like that you can see in many lives you know when your life is going upside down you curse you know you say oh what I'm cursed about because you don't see any solution you don't see anything what you see you see completely darkness you see everything is uh, falling apart but later on in life when you look backward you see that uh, it had been a blessing also you know, because for whatever have happened in your life, that experience has bring you to where you're standing now. You know, so it's not always bad. You know. It is also a blessing itself. Jagu Dev Guruji, you have said that your devotees are your family and that you have come here for them. If so, is there a limitation of the total amount of initiated devotees you will have? How many will, might that be during your lifetime? Look, I am not uh, here, you know, in uh, collecting <laughs> initiated devotee. It can be that uh, somebody is devotee but is not initiated. So, it's not always... Uh, we can't say only the initiate devotee are devotee. Those who follow what I'm saying, they are the devotees, you know. So it can be million, it can be two million, it can be ten million, it can be billions. It doesn't matter for me. You see? So I'm not really concerned about the numbers. You know, I'm what I'm concerned about is how they are transforming, you know. So, if one among them really transform, <laughs> that's it's enough for me. <laughs> Which is quite rare, actually. You see, very often, <coughs> not, you see, let's say, to call yourself a devotee, okay? What it is to be a devotee. You know, it's not just by getting the initiation, you know, very often you hear people just say, oh yeah, I'm an initiated devotee. But yet, that devotee doesn't know anything about their path. When we are talking about the Sri Sampradaya being a uh, vegetarian, being uh, very often you see that uh, they follow certain principle, but yes, they say, yes, I, can, I am a devotee. But yet, to be devotee, the word devoted, which means 
I am devoted to you. You know, I'm giving myself to you. That is very important to understand. I'm offering myself to you. So when I'm offering myself to you, I don't belong to myself. I belong to you. Like the Guru, when you take initiation, the Guru offered himself to the disciple, to the devotee. But the devotee shall receive also the Guru. The same way the devotee is offering themselves at the feet of the Guru, there is both ways happening during an initiation. But the Guru knows when the Guru is offering himself to the devotee. Why the Guru is offering himself to the devotee? For the salvation of that devotee. You know, for that devotee to rise and attain the feet of the Supreme Lord, so that, so that this devotee is pushed from up the Guru, push the devotee, say, go to the feet of the Lord. You know? But does the devotee have the same? Because the devotee has to become humble at that point, allowed the Guru to push him up. For that, it is very important to have a certain understanding of your path itself. It is very important to have knowledge about your path. You see. So to be a devotee, it's not just to put the tilak on or to wear fancy clothes and go around and say, yes, I'm a devotee. No. Inside, inwardly, what is happening to you? A devotee has this inner journey, that inner connection with Bhagwan. And then, this is what makes one a devotee. You know? That's why one mind must fully absorb into the reverence of the feet of the Master. You know? And really understand what it means, really. It's not just to offer a flower, because what are you offering during that flower? It's you're offering your devotion now. You're offering your love. You're offering part of yourself. And when you're offering part of yourself, you, know, you become humble. You become loving. You reflect your Guru. You know, a devotee at all time reflect the Master. You know, very often you were, while traveling in India, I have noticed, you know, certain disciple. I will here. I'm not using the word devotee. I'm using the word disciple of a certain guru. They look alike. Guru and Shishya look alike. Automatically, you know this person is a guru of, uh, is a disciple of so and so. Because the color, I'm not talking about the physical color right now, I don't expect uh, Swami Revati to start looking like me. He will have to really do some good tattooing upon his skin. But the quality, the inner quality reflect through the devotee. The inner quality, the, you know, the master reflect through the devotee. As much as they surrender to the master, as long they, they, the whole attitude change and start to resemble the guru. They don't become the guru. This is very clear because you see very often people misunderstand that. They don't re become the guru, but they start to re resemble in their gesture, the way they speak, the language they speak. So then you see also that humility and that love start shining through them. So this is the quality of a devotee and the quality of a disciple. Yeah, followers also, you know. Like I said at the beginning, you know, I'm not here to collect numbers of people, you know. But it is the duty of everyone whose life have transformed to transform others' life. You know? When you hold a certain light inside of you, 
you can't keep that light. You know, like Jesus said in the Bible, you know, when you have a light, you don't put it under the uh, table or under the cupboard, you know, but you shine that light. So that is a devotee. Guruji, it is written in your commentaries of the Guru Gita that we have to focus our mind on the Guru's feet. My Ishtadev is Krishna and I chant Om Namo Narayanaya. Hmm. My mind is confused. It doesn't know who to focus on. <laughs> Whom do I have to focus my mind on at all times? Well, look, Guru have given you a certain sadhana to do, no? So, your Ishtadev is Krishna. So, is there any difference between Krishna and Narayana? No, there is no difference between Krishna and Narayana. Narayana is Krishna, Krishna is Narayana. I say. So, where you have to focus your mind, firstly, in the morning when you wake up, you have to focus your mind on the feet of the Master. You know. So, this is the first thing that you should do. If you do that first thing in the morning, then you can carry on doing your chanting of Om Namo Narayana and worship of Lord Krishna. So there is no difference between the three actually. You know, Guru is the representative of Narayana. But one have sent him as a reminder of his love and compassion. Yeah. And he have come, Guru have come as a reminder at where one mind should be focusing. You see, the mind of a devotee is focused at the feet of the Guru. By focusing one mind at the feet of the Guru, the Guru sees that one is ready to worship the Lord in a form, so that one can build a certain relationship. Because our, throughout our life, we are, we are in a state of relationship. No? Whatever we do, we do it through relationship. So, of course, the mantra is important because you can't carry your deity around. You carry the deity in the form of the name with you. So, where is your mind focusing? Yeah. Is at the feet of the master and on your deity. That is the, what the mind can understand. Can your mind focus on the name? The name is not tangible. The name is vibratory. So your mind can't focus on a certain vibration. The vibration transforms you inwardly and outwardly. So, through you being consciously aware of things, so meaning your mind is very active, you know, you don't know how quickly your mind can jump from one side to the other. So through the mind being very active, you can focus it only on two things, which is physical and material to you, which is firstly, the feet of the master and the form of your ishtadev. Otherwise, you see, it's always beautiful at the beginning, you know, when you start your spiritual path, you know, it's always joyful and happy, you know, when you have a certain enthusiasm inside of you. But then after that, what happened? That enthusiasm also fade away. Fade away. You become natural, normal. You know, in <coughs> Bhagavad Gita chapter 11, verse 45, we see that clearly, actually when uh, Bhagavan have shown his cosmic form to Arjun. Yeah? In the, what does he say? He yeah, no. said, Lord, please, I'm very happy to have seen your cosmic form. Yeah, no. I'm very joyful about that form. But it made me fearful. I tremble with that form. Please, be back to that form which I am accustomed to, that sweet form. Yeah. 
You see, when the mind, when we start our spiritual path, you know, there's this enthusiasm in oneself, you know. I want to do something, I want to change this, I want to change that. You have great uh, uh, list that you have. Then you do it for one month, two months, one year, then it starts to fade. I said, okay, yes, okay. My daily routine start coming because this is how your mind has been conceived to. See? If you don't keep your mind on track, on focus, but this is my aim, really, and I want only that, it will fade away. The same when Arjun do this prayer to Bhagavan Krishna and said, please reveal, give me, I, this form is terrible. I'm very excited. There's an excitement into it. No? But then what? The mind kick in, you know? That fear start to arise. Okay, now that I have seen this cosmic form, you know, I have seen you in who you are truly. I can't handle that. Because very often people said, God, please give me yourself. Give me yourself. But one said, okay, I'll come. Would you be able to handle him? If you don't have any relationship with him, you will never be able to handle him. Even those who have relationship with him could not handle him. You know? That's why previous to that, you know, he prayed, please forgive me. You know, he asked Bhagwan, chapter 11, verse 44, no? he asked uh, uh, Lord Krishna, please forgive me. Your oh, adorable Lord, please forgive me. I have, in any way, if I have made any offense to you, please forgive me. Just like a father forgive his son, just like a friend forgive uh, his friend, just like a lover forgive his beloved. Forgive me. I implore you for that forgiveness. Yeah. Because, you see, again, it's about our relationship. It's about this, uh, this relationship that we have through many incarnations. What we recognize, you see, what we think we know about. It comes to a point of saying that, yes, I don't know anything. I have always have a certain conception of things that I know because I have read it somewhere, I've heard it somewhere. But the Bhaktad realized that throughout their life they don't know anything. The only thing that it is know is only that I have to hold strongly at the feet of the Guru and God. <coughs> so, you see, there is two kinds of Bhakti. In one life, you know, we have and Madhurya Bhakti, two kind of Bhakti. Eshwarya Bhakti, we stand, we have our relationship, but we stand far away from each another. We are far. I'm here. I do everything as a submission to your will. Just like a king, you know. A king is in his uh, palace. Everybody is submit to the king. So they will have devotion in their service, but they can't have that intimacy into their service. Note one thing you see, the service is the same. But that intimacy, that relationship, that closeness is not there. Then you have Madhurya Bhakti. Madhurya Bhakti normally is uh, divided into four, four steps. Yes. So, you know this Bhakti. Dhastya Bhakti, Sakya Bhakti. Vatsalya Bhakti and? And? Na? <laughs> Madhurya Bhakti. So, Dasya Bhakti is uh, when 
we have a certain feeling of serving. We are servant to the Lord. Like Hanumanji, no? Like uh, the devotees have. Sakya Bhakti is even more intimate. It's like a friend. Often the saints, they see God as a friend. It's funny, but the, 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 again, I said it's only the Vedic tradition that gives this kind of relationship to God. Other tradition doesn't give that. Because in Sakya Bhakti, how, who can say, yes, God is my friend? Nobody can say that. You know? Because if you have fear inside of you, you can't call God your friend. You can't say, I'm scared of my friend. No. You have a certain relationship with a friend, but there's an openness. There is a certain understanding that my friend, understanding, the understanding of my friend, my friend understands me more than anybody else. So I can tell everything to my friend. I can act in a certain way to my friend, if it is your dear friend. Uh, your friend will not have that judgment because your friend will always be there for you. No matter what, no matter how you are, your friend, if they call themselves a friend, they will always be there for you. And that relationship, you see uh, clearly with the Gopas with, of Vrindavan with Lord Krishna, you know, they, had, they could take Krishna on their shoulder you know, they could eat and give Krishna the leftover, and Krishna will happily accept it. They will beat Krishna, and Krishna will beat them. They will run behind him. They will do all kind of uh, of a mischief with him. That kind of mischief. This is a dearness which a friend has. This a das can't do. A servant can't do. Then. Vatsalya Bhav, not everybody can have Vatsalya Bhav. This is unique in itself. Where you are taking the Supreme Lord Himself as a child. You see Him, that dearness, that you can't see Him differently. You can't see Him as a friend, you can't see Him as a servant, you can't see Him as a beloved. You see Him as a child. You know, in certain sampradaya, they worship baby Krishna. You know, for them, they have that devotion that this is how I want to serve you. They serve him as baby Krishna. For him, they have this vatsalya, bhav inside of them, that bhakti as a parent have, you know. Just like uh, Nanda and Yashoda have, Dashrat have, you know, and so on. Many saints also have it, but which is quite rare in itself. Then you have Madhurya Bhakti in itself, Madhurya Bhav in other traditions, they will say. That Bhakti is unique. This is what our soul long. <coughs> that bhakti, you see the gopis of Vrindavan have for Krishna. Not only the gopis of Vrindavan, many great saints, the lover of the Lord, they had this. Where God become the lover. It brings one that they bring that intimacy even more deeper. But I'm not living my life for me. I love. I'm living my life for my beloved. Uh, and uh, whatever I do is to please my beloved. You see, when you are in love, freshly in love, especially, your mind is constantly only thinking about your beloved. 
wherever you are, whatever you're doing, what is he doing or what is her doing. So your mind is fully saturated with the remembrance and thinking of my beloved one. So this kind of bhakti, you know, it's also there. So this too, form of bhakti, which is Aishwarya bhakti and Madhurya bhakti, that one can really go into worship of the feet of the Master and God. Until here and here you have been clear that there is no difference between the feet of the Guru and the feet of the Lord Himself. Without the feet of the Guru, you will never reach the feet of the Lord. But it is only through the grace which Bhagwan has given through the Guru to you, you have reached to where you are. Jagadip, you tell us to love each other and that God is love. Unfortunately, when people fall in love or lead a relationship, they often get very rajasic because of their attraction for each other. But in the Gita, Krishna tells us to transcend and overcome all the gunas. So here's my question. Does human love always lead into these qualities or can we learn to love transcendentally even in a relationship? <laughs> Look, there is many relationships which, uh, of course, at the beginning, because you have a certain tendency, you know, the love start firstly with rajasic quality, you know, because this is what people live in their life about. You know, you go into your, in the daily activity of your life, you know, and you want a life to be how everybody wants to uh, have a normal life, you know, let's say a mundane life itself. Until you understand that life is not just to live like, because the animal also lives like that, you know. So when we take a, a bundle, when we decide to take a bundle of uh, this uh, rajasic quality, put it all together and surrender it to the feet of God, then say, yes, but I'm ready for that, to, for that transformation to happen. I'm ready for, you know, you can see that in the life of devotees very often. Their life gets transformed once they have reached their spiritual path. They realize that, yes, I don't want to live that kind of life anymore. I have lived that kind of life. Did that life give me really happiness? It is becoming just a routine, just a mundane routine. I'm doing the same thing daily, you know. I'm with the same people, I'm talking the same thing. How many people live that kind of life? The whole world is living this kind of life. But when you go on the spiritual path, you are called to transform your life, to rise beyond these limitations, to attain, to get something even more deeper. Yeah. So this is when you do your sadhana, you know, you fully say, yes, I am committed. And especially if you both, husband, wife, children, are on the path, it's, it's easier. Because otherwise, one will start to transform, the other one will never be able to handle. Because you see, when you start to, to, to rise upon the ladder of spirituality, you detach from that normality of things. Because you see, when you are on the normality, you are looking at each other, you have a certain understanding of each another. I say, so this one understand this one, this one understand that one. So when you start growing spiritually, that detach itself. You understand what is down, but down can't understand what is up here. It's like when you are going up on a stairs. When you are down, you don't know what is happening up on the roof or on the top floor, whatever you want to call it. You go middle, you see from a certain angle what is happening, but you don't have any clear view of what is happening. Down, they don't have any clue what is happening. You have start to have a certain clue what is happening. That transformation between down and in the middle itself is a big different. 
So more you're growing, you have you reach to the top floor, you have a clear view of the whole things. When you have a clear view of the whole things, what is happening up there, you have the clue, you have the understanding. But those which is down, they don't have that understanding. Even if you try to explain to them, they will not understand what is happening. So it's important also to understand them, you know, but uh, not everybody is on the same level of spirituality. So those who really goes above that, they have even a clearer understanding of life itself. And one thing is very important is to share, really, you know, whether the person wants to listen or not. Try to share that understanding in a language which the people understand also. Because you see, when we go on the spiritual path, we speak a different language. And that language, somebody which is in the Rajasik or in the world itself, they will not understand that language. So if you want really to give a certain knowledge of spirituality to a mundane people, try to use their language of understanding, things that they understand, and try to explain it. So, okay. Jagudeva Vadeh.